everybody. Hope you all slept well. Um, Want to just tell you a little bit about how, uh, how we're doing, how we've started the year. And we're off to the best um, start to a year that we've ever had at Hyundai. It's really good. We're up a couple of percent. Um, honestly, we're still struggling to grow with the industry. Uh, we still have those production capacity constraints, uh, but we're selling cars as fast as we can make them. We had all-time record January, an all-time record February. Um, our retail market share right now, about 4.6%. Our transaction prices are trending in the right direction. Uh, the average Hyundai these days sells for $23,262, um, and that's up about 3% from last year. And um, if you look at days to turn in the industry, how quickly brands are, are turning their cars, selling their cars, the industry average is about 60, which you've heard a lot, it's 59 days right now actually. Um, we're number three in the industry at speed of turn. Uh, Subaru is number one, uh, Kia is second, uh, Subaru at 35, Kia at 36, and uh, we're turning our, our inventory at 39 days. And this is typical of, of Hyundai for whatever reason, and we don't fully understand it. We often get off to a little bit of a slow start and gain traction as we get closer to spring. Uh, it could have something to do with the fact that our lineup doesn't have a lot of all-wheel drive vehicles, um, which is one of the reasons why we're here today launching the new Santa Fe. Uh, but you can see our retail share here on a week-by-week -week basis. This is provided by J.D. Power. Uh, they, they're the, probably the best at getting folks in the industry, in companies, the sense of where they are on a week-by-week -week basis retail market share. Um, and we're, we're now clicking around at about 5% market share, which is where we need to be to hit our target this year, our sales target for the full year. Um, we have some great news on residual value. You know, we, we've talked about this with you guys for the last couple of years, and now that we've launched just about all of the new products and are beginning to launch the new ones, we have a new Genesis and a new Sonata just around the corner. Uh, but you get a sense for how well these products have been perceived in the marketplace from a residual value standpoint. Uh, we've gone from 47% well, in 2011 to 49, now up to 53%. And people don't give us a lot of credit for this yet, um, but it's true and it's amazing. Hyundai is now the number two brand in residual value um, in the industry, only behind Honda um, and just ahead of Scion and, and Subaru. So we've made great strides, you guys know, just you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, residual value was one of the Achilles heels for the brand, and now it's a real strength for us. <coughs> um, just a little um, update on Blue Link. We may have some, uh, some new news for you on, on what we're doing with Blue Link in the New York Auto Show. Uh, we're really pleased with the way Blue Link is launching for us. Um, we have had 370,000 enrollments since we've launched Blue Link. Um, about 50 to 60 percent of the cars we're selling right now are standard um, Blue Link equipped. Um, we get about 10,000, um, we've had about 10,000 emergency assistance events, and we're averaging about 1,000 per month right now of, of people hitting the SOS button or an automatic crash notification that the car um, has had an accident. We're sending out folks uh, to come and get you. Um, we send out monthly vehicle reports to Blue Link subscribers. We've sent about 2 million of those out so far. And we get a whole ton, Gary, this is the thing I was talking to you about, we get a whole ton of um, remote starts. And one of the great advantages of our Blue Link system is if you have push button start, you can start your car from your smartphone. <coughs> it's a tremendous advantage that other systems, cell phone enabled systems like Sync can't match. We can talk to the car uh, from our phone to the car. And long term, we think that's going to be the answer, and every car is going to be that way. Um, you're going to see more and more of a focus from Hyundai on features like this one, where you can talk to your car from your iPhone and do things like start it. So Santa Fe has been in the market now. Um, really, its first full month of retail sales was uh, September, the all-new Santa Fe Sport. And it's doing really well. You can get a sense for our sales tracking here, um, comparing September through February last year to September 12, February 13 this year. Um, our sales are up 37%, so the new Santa Fe Sport has been received really well. Um, it's a difficult segment. These are, we consider the, uh, the big players in the segment. You can see Chevy Equinox, credit to uh, GM, is the number one selling compact SUV as we categorize them. Um, followed by, depending on the month, the uh, Sorento or the Edge, and then, uh, and then there's Santa Fe, and then Toyota Venza. Those are what we see as the key competitive set for the Santa Fe Sport. Um, the, the short news for, for us is that sales are up. This is another car that we are unfortunately capacity constrained on, um, but it's selling very well and uh, turning at a very quick rate. 
Um, Santa Fe is right now returning in, in just 19 days. You saw our Hyundai average was in the high 30s. Santa Fe's turned in just 19 days, the fastest in the segment by far. And we've done what you want to do with a vehicle launch. We're selling more cars, and we're selling them at a higher average transaction price. So average Santa Fe Sport now <coughs> is selling at $29,200. And this is a pretty cool chart. It shows you the percentage of MSRP that we're getting for the car. It's another indication of the demand for the car. So we're getting about 95.9% of MSRP with each Santa Fe Sport we sell. Um, Edge requires quite a bit of discount. You can tell it's, that it usually happens to cars at the end of their life cycle. Edge is selling at 88.7% of MSRP. Equinox still pretty strong at 95. There's Venza at 94.5. And the Sorento at, at just about 90%. And where are these buyers coming from? Um, it's a, a shout out to Honda CRV. Even though they're not specifically in this segment, there is a lot of cross shop with CRV buyers, um, ultimate CRV buyers, because it is the best selling uh, crossover in the land, the Honda CRV. So we see that on top of this chart. We also see a lot of interaction with Sorento and Edge. Of course, products in our own um, vehicle line and vehicles like Terrain and Escape. And in terms of who is buying, um, average age, 52, this is about the average age for the whole industry, uh, as a matter of fact. About 30% some college graduate plus, and about 76,000. In essence, Santa Fe buyers look just like Edge buyers, who look just like uh, Venza buyers. Very similar uh, demographics there. So now we move on to the new Santa Fe, and, and we have a unique strategy. We talked about it when we saw some of you guys in Park City, Utah, when we launched this car. That This was a rare two-wheel based strategy. Um, you've seen it in minivans, with the caravan and grand caravan. Uh, you've seen it sometimes in large luxury cars, where there might be a single, uh, a short wheelbase and then a longer wheelbase variant. Um, few have done it in the crossover segment, and we thought it made a lot of sense for us um, because B pillar forward, we wanted these cars to be the same. It gave us some efficiencies from an engineering standpoint. Of course, it gives us some big efficiencies from a marketing standpoint. I can tell you, it's difficult to get traction on a new model name these days. It's very, very tough. Um, we tried with Veracruz, which was a great vehicle. Um, but in the end, um, we just didn't have the marketing resources to put the weight behind Veracruz to make it as successful as it deserved to be. Um, so we now have a Santa Fe Sport and a Santa Fe. And I want to take you back one more step so you get a sense of what our overall way of thinking is in, in the crossover market. Um, and honey, we like to think of things in their simplest way. And the simplest way to think of segmentation, and you can use this really in the whole industry, is to segment buyers into three groups, pre-family, family, and post-family. Um, most new car buyers these days are post-family. Um, that's where there is affluence and wealth and you can afford to buy new vehicles, actually. Um, and we do very well in the post-family um, segment. I'll, I'll show you some data there. Um, but in essence, what we're doing is simply saying, okay, the Tucson, your primary target for incremental buyers is pre-family. The Santa Fe, the big Santa Fe, which can hold up to seven people, six or seven people, that'll be our vehicle to target families. And the Santa Fe Sport, which we've already launched, um, is the post-family vehicle, the empty nester vehicle. And that's working really well. This is actual data for how Santa Fe Sport is doing. And it shows just 13% of Santa Fe Sport buyers are pre-family, 16 family, and a whopping 71% are, are post-family. Um, on the Tucson side of the house, we've been in market with the Tucson for a while. Um, that is our most successful crossover in terms of attracting pre-family buyers. Um, and we have some smaller families there. And the Santa Fe column is based on our experience with Veracruz, where we have the biggest percentage of buyers coming from the family group. Um, so our strategy now is, um, can we grow that further with more volume with the six and seven passenger Santa Fe? And this chart has a lot of data on here, but it, but it gives you some insights into why we think the idea makes sense. Um, I want to focus you on the, uh, the little gray bar in the middle of these bars. What this shows is percentage of sales that come from post family. You can see for almost every brand, or, or for every brand on this chart, it's the predominant percentage of sales. The auto industry right now sells cars to people who don't have kids, remarkably, for the most part, post-family. Um, and some brands are very, very high. Ford and Chevrolet, this is total brand, including pickup trucks. Interesting point, 55.9% of Ford sales are to people post-family. 
Um, and then you can see, for example, for Ford, not picking them, just showing because it's close, 22% uh, family and 21% uh, pre-family. For Hyundai, the interesting observation is we have the lowest penetration of our total sales mix in the family segment. But yet we know our brand has a lot of appeal to family buyers, the things we stand for, the attributes we deliver, like fuel economy and value and safety and the warranty. These are things that family buyers want, but they haven't had a car that they could really buy from Hyundai. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're so bullish on the new Santa Fe and its six and seven passenger versions. Um, and you can see in the past, we've done quite well um, with family, with vehicles like the Veracruz, but we see some of the upside. Um, interestingly, Mazda CX-9, uh, tremendous penetration uh, for a percentage of buyers and families. Uh, the only over 50% pilot does very well. Highlander and Explore. So um, with Santa Fe, um, we're really opening up a whole new market um, for Hyundai to, to tap in a way that we think Veracruz couldn't do before, again, because we had limited volume there and limited marketing budgets. So just a little bit of history on Santa Fe before I hand off to Mike to take you through some of the, the specifics. Um, Santa Fe launched um, as a 2,000 mile a year vehicle, more or less, and if you think back to that time, um, there wasn't a whole lot on the market. There was CRV and RAV4 unibody crossovers. And Ford Escape, the first generation Ford Escape was launching at about the same time as Santa Fe launched. And Santa Fe was a tremendous success um, from Hyundai's standpoint. This was before my time here, uh, but I understand the initial sales targets were 40,000 units. And within a year or two, 100,000, right? 100,000 units. So it just blew past all of the uh, expectations for the cars. That segment really took off. Um, it was one of the things that helped get Hyundai uh, to the position it is at now. Um, by 2007, we had moved to the second generation Santa Fe with a real focus on design and safety, which was our formula uh, for that period uh, of our growth. And now with the third generation, uh, the key strategy growing on, on our design platform, two wheelbases and um, two sets of powertrains, actually three separate powertrains in total. And this is a way to, to think about it, right? Um, and, and hopefully it'll make more sense now that you'll have a chance to interact with the cars today. The Santa Fe Sport is the five passenger version of the Santa Fe. The Santa Fe GLS is the seven passenger, and the Limited is always a six passenger. And the reason for that is typically the two, two, and two seating arrangement is, is considered a more premium uh, seating arrangement, so we've given that the Limited designation. And this is the little cheat sheet that you might find helpful just to, to easily see what the differences are between the Santa Fe Sport um, and the Santa Fe GLS and Limited variants. Um, as you can see, seating capacity, we've got eight and a half inches of length, about four inches of wheelbase, and nearly 40 cubic feet of total volume difference between the Santa Fe Sport and the six and seven passenger versions. Um, the Santa Fe Sport runs with four-cylinder engine strategy, either the base 2.4 direct injected or the two-liter turbo. Um, and we've got the 3.3 liter V6 um, in all the vehicles you'll be driving today. That's the standard powertrain. Uh, dealer's about 290 horsepower. Um, our first vehicle with 5,000 pounds of trailer tow, and that comes standard uh, with every Santa Fe. Um, dual exhaust and standard 18-inch, optional 18-inch wheel. Um, and just a quick look at how we segment things at Hyundai. Every manufacturer segments crossovers differently, but we look at it as subcompact, compact, and midsize in terms of the segments in which we play. And we place Tucson with these competitors in the subcompact segment. Um, Santa Fe Sport is in the largest compact segment. A lot of good, strong competitors there. And then uh, Santa Fe, because it's a six and seven passenger three row vehicle, uh, we put in the midsize segment. And these are who we see as our primary competitors. The Honda Pilot, the Toyota Highlander, and of course the, the new Nissan Pathfinder. It's a very impressive vehicle. Um, secondary competitive set, Ford Explorer, and the Mazda CX-9. And there it is.